The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Many Americans doubt the findings of the Warren Commission. Only one American has had and used legal powers to investigate those findings. And that one is Jim Garrison, the District Attorney of New Orleans. His investigation has made headlines for four months. This is an examination of that investigation. The JFK Conspiracy, the case of Jim Garrison, reported by Frank McGee. Four months ago, Jim Garrison said he had positively solved the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. He said a man named David Ferry was under surveillance. When Ferry died, suddenly he called him one of history's most important figures. On March 1st, he arrested a New Orleans businessman named Clay Shaw and charged him with participation in the conspiracy. He said there would be more arrests, a considerable number of them. He said the key to the whole case is through the looking glass. Black is white. White is black. We have no right to prejudge Jim Garrison's case. We can legitimately examine his record up to now. Our starting point is the pretrial hearing of Clay Shaw. Garrison had two key witnesses. The first was a 26-year-old insurance salesman named Perry Raymond Russo. Russo testified that in September 1963, He'd gone to a party in David Ferry's apartment. Among the guests were several Cubans, Ferry's bearded roommate, and a man named Clay Bertrand. Later, when the other guest had left, he found himself alone with Ferry, the roommate whom he identified as Lee Harvey Oswald and Bertrand. Well, despite his presence, they began to discuss openly and in detail a plan to assassinate President Kennedy. Russo was asked if Bertrand was in the courtroom. He said yes. He was asked to point out Berkman. He got up from the witness chair, walked over to the defense table, and held his hand over the head of Clay Shaw. Garrison's second key witness was Vernon Bundy, a 29-year-old narcotics addict. Mainly on the testimony of Russo and Bundy, a three-judge panel decided that there was sufficient evidence to establish probable cause that a crime had been committed. In answer to criticism of his witnesses, Garrison pointed out that it was hard to find bank presidents at the scene of this conspiracy. He defended Vernon Bundy. The question is, is he telling the truth or not? There are many attorneys who are brilliant liars, and there are dope addicts who have never learned to lie. And that's the case here. The question is, was he telling the truth? And the answer is obviously. Now, Vernon Bundy has been a narcotics addict since he was 13. He has a police record. On March 4th, 1967, according to Garrison, Bundy turned himself in to New Orleans Parish Prison because he was back on the habit. Bundy says he was first interviewed by Garrison's men the day before he testified. Two fellow prisoners told NBC News Bundy had indicated to them that his testimony that he had seen Shaw and Oswald together was not true. John Kanzler, known as John the Baptist, What's your profession, Mr. Kanzler? What was my profession? Yes. I was a burglar. And you were in the parish prison on this burglary route. Right. And did you meet a man named Vernon Bundy there? I found out later his name was Vernon Bundy. See, I didn't know what his name was until I read the paper. After this, uh, I only knew him by legs. Now, what did Legs tell you up there? He just said, I wonder whether I should see I saw him on the Esplanade. I saw him on the lakefront. I said, man, I said, it's getting better. You start talking to yourself, too. You know, you know, like some of these guys go stir above, you know? He said, no, man. He said, I, I'm talking about this cat Shaw. I said, what you talking about, man? He said, man, I, I don't know what it's best for me to say that I saw him on Esplanade Street on the lakefront. Did Bundy indicate to you whether the story that he was going to tell in court was true? Did he end, how could he indicate when he would ask me, should he say this or should he say that? If, he, if it was the truth, he would know what to say. 
It was obvious from what he told you that he was going to tell a lie then? He told a lie. Did he tell well, you it was a lie? Sure, I asked him, I said, man, is this the truth? He said, no. He said, no, it's not the truth. Also in parish prison at the time Bundy testified was Miguel Torres, serving a nine-year sentence for burglary. He met Bundy in a prison hospital. What did he tell you about his testimony that day? He said, well, uh, that's the only way that uh, I can get cut loose. I asked him how much time did he owe uh, the state. He said he owed the state five years. He was out on five-year probation. And uh, then I said, well, that's a hell of a thing you're doing in order to... Uh, to do what you want to do. He says, well, uh, the reason I'm doing this is because this is the only way that I can uh, get cut loose. In other words, he said to you, in effect, that he was testifying as he was in the Shaw hearing in order to uh, prevent his probation from being revoked. Is right. that right? From being violated, yes. Did you get the impression that he knew that his testimony in the hearing had been false? Well, just exactly how I said it. He said, the reason I'm doing this is because you, that's the only way I can get cut loose. And the impression I got was that, that uh, he was out front lie. Jim Garrison told a BBC reporter he uses what he calls objectifying tests to make sure his witnesses are telling the truth. Now, one such test is a polygraph, the lie detector. On the morning he testified, Vernon Bundy was given a lie detector test. NBC News has learned that the results of the test indicated that Bundy was lying. Assistant District Attorney Charles Ward was informed of this, and Ward went to Garrison. He told Garrison that in view of the outcome of the lie detector test, the indication that Bundy was lying, Bundy should not be allowed to testify. Despite this, Bundy was put on the witness stand by Garrison. He testified against Shaw. Partly as a result of that testimony, Shaw was held for trial. More important than Bundy was Perry Russo. He was, in fact, vital to Garrison's case. He linked Shaw, Ferry, and Oswald. He involved them in the conspiracy to kill John F. Kennedy. Well, how did he come into the case? By his own account, he wrote a letter to Jim Garrison saying he had some information about David Ferry's connection with the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, this was on February 22nd, 1967. That same week, he was interviewed by a reporter from the NBC affiliate in Baton Rouge. What, uh, what kind of remarks did David Ferry will make about uh, the assassination to you? Toward the end of September and October, I saw him on several occasions, and he brought out the fact in passing remark, whether or not it had any <coughs> undue meaning or anything else, I don't know, and I'm not trying to add words to his meaning, but he said that we will get him referring to the president because we were on elaborate discussions concerning the president. He said, we will get the president, referring to Kennedy. In his first public interview, Russo mentioned no party at Ferry's apartment, no assassination plot, no Clay Shaw or Clay Bertrand. Next, he talked to a reporter from WDSU-TV. Do it all with the assassination in any way? Well, uh of that I don't know and I you know it'd be just specula speculation did he ever mention Lee Harvey Oswald's name no no conversation at all about no I, I had never heard of Oswald until uh, the television of uh, assassination two weeks later he would testify at the hearings he would positively identify Lee Oswald and Clay Shaw he would describe in detail the party at which they were present he would tell about a plot to kill the president well, what had happened we know that Russo was visited in Baton Rouge by one of Garrison's assistants, Andrew Chambre. We know that he spent time on at least three other occasions with a man from Garrison's office, and we now know some additional facts. Jim Phelan covered the conspiracy story for the Saturday Evening Post. Nine days before the hearing, he met Jim Garrison in Las Vegas. He spent ten hours with Garrison discussing the case. Did he give you any documents to read in connection with this? Yes, he uh, gave me two documents. One of them was a um, long memorandum written by uh, Mr. Garrison's uh, first, uh, his first assistant uh, district attorney, uh, Andrew Chambre, which uh, recounted a interview that he had had with Perry Russo in Baton Rouge. Uh, this was the first interview that anyone uh, from the DA's office had had with Perry Russo. And what was the second document? The second document was a uh, hypnotic 
interrogation of um, Russo, I believe it was four days after the first interrogation. Did Russo tell the same story in both of these uh, documents? He did not. As a witness, Russo said he was at a party at David Ferry's apartment and present when Ferry, Clay Shaw, and Lee Harvey Oswald plotted to kill President Kennedy. Did he tell this story in his first interview? He said nothing whatever about a uh, party or a plot in the first interview. Was he able to identify Oswald? They made an identification after uh, they sketched a series of beards on the picture of Lee Oswald. They, I think they drew 18 or 20 of them before he finally came up with the identification. Was Russo shown a picture of Clay Shaw? Yes, he was. Did he identify the picture of the man he knew to be Shaw as Clay Bertrand? He did not. He simply said that he had seen the man. How many times had he, he seen said he'd seen him twice. And where had he seen him? He saw him once when uh, Kennedy was visiting uh, New Orleans to dedicate the Nashville Wharf, and the second time he said he saw this man in a car with Dave Ferry. Did he mention seeing him at a party in Ferry's apartment where people had plotted to kill Kennedy? He said nothing about it. In fact, he said specifically that he had seen him twice, and he said specifically the two times. When did Russo first describe the details he testified to as a witness at the pretrial hearing? Uh, he first uh, mentioned the plot and the party and the presence of uh, Shaw, Oswald, and Ferry uh, in a deep hypnotic trance when he was, uh, he was hypnotized by uh, uh, Dr. Es Esmond Fatter. Did he remember Shaw and an assassination plot immediately under hypnosis? He did not. He volunteered uh, no information about uh, the party or the plot. When did he begin to remember? He began to remember when uh, Dr. Fatter asked him a uh, series of leading questions. Well, I would say it went beyond that. Uh, Dr. Fatter set the stage for him. He told him uh, uh, that he would be present in uh, Ferry's apartment and that Shaw and Oswald and Ferry would be there, and that they would be discussing assassinating someone, and then Dr. Fetter says, now tell me about it. Am I correct in reading this from the record? Quote, Dr. Fatter saying, quote, any time you want to, you can permit yourself to become calm, cool, and collected. You will be amazed at how acute your memory will become in the next few weeks. That's correct. How did Russo appear when you saw him testify? He was a calm, cool, and collected. Why do you feel that you've had to use extraordinary methods like truth drugs and hypnotism to get these people to give their evidence? We decided to give him objectifying uh, machinery to make sure he was telling the truth. We gave him the truth serum in order to make sure. Now, it uh, seems to me that uh, this is rather unusual, uh, a, a, a prosecution, a, a prosecuting office, which has a pretty good case making its witness take objectifying tests to make sure they're telling the truth. We did it for this reason. We, did, uh, we used hypnosis for the same thing, just to make sure that he was telling the truth. Dr. J. Katz is associate professor of law and associate professor of clinical psychology at Yale. We showed him the stenographic transcripts of two of Dr. Fatter's hypnotic sessions with Perry Russo. Doctor, how reliable, in your view, are sodium pentothal and hypnotism as means of reaching the truth? There's a very widespread belief that under hypnosis and under sodium amytol, subjects will tell the objective truth. But under hypnosis, at least a great many subjects may have greater difficulty to differentiate, differentiate between fact and fantasy. Dr. Katz, does it appear to you that some of the questions by the interviewer uh, questioning Perry Russo suggest the answers? I wondered about this and I was very much struck that uh, on many occasions the hypnotist introduced very leading questions. This was most striking, if I just can use one example, when he directly asked him or in fact, uh, not even ask him, but told him to tell him about the 
conversation that took place with respect to an assassination plot. Would you comment on the manner in which the interviews with Perry Russo were conducted? Made it more rather than less difficult to separate fact from fantasy? Uh, yes, he made no attempt, as far as I can see, to press further and at least attempt to find out uh, what was fantasy and what was reality. Then you don't feel that there was sufficient questioning to find out whether Rousseau was in fact telling the truth or was distorting the truth? This is quite correct. This is always very, very difficult, but uh, one at least can make an attempt, and this attempt was not made in this case. Did you ever talk to Garrison about the discrepancies in his reports? Well, after the uh, hearing in which Mr. Shaw was held at trial, I called Garrison and I said, uh, uh, Jim, there's something bothers me uh, deeply. Uh, so he said, well, I'll get uh, Chambre out here. And he called him right away on the phone and he uh, had him come out to his uh, home. He also had his chief investigator, William Gerbich, and the four of us. Uh, sat there in garrison study, and I uh, put this to Chambre. I said, there's nothing in your original interrogation about, one, um, uh, Shaw knowing Oswald, Shaw knowing Ferry, about the man you identified as having seen, uh, about knowing him as, uh, as Bertrand, or about a uh, party at uh, Ferry's apartment in which they discussed the assassination. In fact, all of the things that were so damaging to Shaw that uh, were not in the original report. Chambry first told me that I didn't know what I was talking about because Mr. Chambry didn't know that I had a copy of this report. And then I told him that I had a copy of it and I'd read it many times. And at this point, Mr. Chambry changed his story. And he said, well, maybe he had left it out of the report, uh, that uh, he had written the report under trying circumstances and he'd been doing a number of other things and he might have forgotten to put it in. And I told him I simply couldn't believe this. The next day I went, I thought, it, well, at least he would have, if Chambray were telling uh, a straightforward story, that he would have mention of the crime in his original notes. He might have left it out of the report, but he at least would have taken it down when he was talking to, to Russo because he took detailed notes. So I went back to Chambray and I asked him, well, I said, where are your original notes? We can, we can settle this quickly. Mr. Chambray told me he had burned his notes. Chambray says Phelan's story is incomplete and distorted. To objectify the testimony of Perry Russo, whom Garrison described as a very stable young man, Russo was submitted to sodium pentothal, hypnotism, and on March 8, six days before he testified to a lie detector test. NBC News has learned the following facts about this test. Russo's answers to a series of questions indicate, in the language of the polygraph operator, deception criteria. He was asked if he knew Clay Shaw. He was asked if he knew Lee Harvey Oswald. His yes answers to both of those questions indicated deception criteria. Russo's general reaction to this series of questions led the polygraph operator to suspect a psychopathic personality. At least one investigator and one assistant district attorney in Garrison's office were present. The list of questions was taken away from the polygraph operator, and he was told not to say anything. Despite the incomplete tests, the preliminary indications of deception criteria, six days later, Russo was put on the stand as the chief witness against Clay Shaw. The core of his testimony was his description of a party sometime in September 1963. He said Ferry, Oswald, and Shaw were there. Rousseau also said several of his friends were present in the early part of the evening. Sandra Moffat, Kenny Carter, Lefty Peterson. We talked with Lefty Peterson. And, uh, David Ferry. Yes, I did. Uh, and, and how did you meet Ferry? I met him at Ferry's house. Did you see David Ferry uh, uh, at any other time? I've seen him twice. Since then, since then. I seen him once on the Louisiana Parkway. I went to I went to his house with Perry and some other people. Uh, about four of us stopped him. We stayed for about 20, 25 minutes and left. All of you left? Uh, no, Perry stayed there. I think he didn't. He didn't leave. When uh, was this? September, 1963. 
describe that occurrence? Was coming from a, some kind of sports event, mm, football game, I think. You remember who played? No sir. Was it a Tulane game or? Oh uh, yes, sir, Tulane, yes sir. I and mean, you're pretty sure it was a football game, no? Positive. But what made you think it was in September? Well, it was the first game of the season. Even yeah. the first or second game of the season, one of the two. Tulane played two home games that year. One October 4th, the other September 20th. Under hypnosis, Russo said the party took place September 16th. Under oath, he said the party took place sometime, he wasn't sure when, in mid-September. Kenny Carter remembers going to a game with Russo. He thinks it was the Miami game on October 4th. The date is crucial. Is it possible that Lee Harvey Oswald could have been present, wearing a beard and looking like a beatnik on those dates? If not, Garrison's hearing case collapses. Where was Lee Harvey Oswald on September 20th? Arrived in New Orleans. Do you remember, remember the date? Yes, I think I do. I think it was the 20th of September. That would be, it was a Friday. And how long were you there? Over the weekend, left Monday. Where did you stay when you were in New At Orleans? their apartment. You, and can you tell me whether or not Lee was living at home all of the time? He was staying there evenings. Oh, yes, he was. That's Lee was there um, the entire time. In September of 1963, did you see him, Lee Harvey Oswald, often, or did you hear him in the house? Well, I used to hear him in the house all the time. I mean, him and his wife used to do a lot of arguing, and the baby would start crying. That's how I knew he was home. When would you say Lee Harvey Oswald left the apartment? Well, I know he left the same night that his wife left that day. Now, whether it was... The 24th or the 25th, I don't remember exactly, but that same day his wife left, he left that night. Two witnesses say Lee Harvey Oswald could not have been living with David Ferry on September 20th. Oswald was living at home in New Orleans on September 20th. On October 4th, the date of the Miami Tulane game, he was in Dallas. He registered with the YMCA. He called Ruth Payne on the telephone. At two in the afternoon, he was interviewed for a job by Ted Gangle of the Paget Printing Corporation. Could he have been Ferry's roommate at any time in September 1963? You arrived at the party at David Ferry's house. Who answered the door, do you remember? Oh, his roommate. Describe his height, his general build, and... He's about 6 or 6'1", six about 170 pounds, I would say. 165, 170 pounds. Was he quite a bit taller than you? Oh, yeah, he was taller than me, yeah. How tall are you? 5'9". So, how much taller than you would he have been? About two or three inches. Lee Harvey Oswald was exactly five feet nine inches tall, exactly as tall as Lefty Peterson. Russo, in trying to identify the roommate with the beard, said, Peterson, quote, would know more about the roommate and be able to identify it. To you, and I'm going to see if you think this fits the description of the man you saw in David Perry's apartment. Uh, I'm quoting Perry Russo. He said the roommate had sort of dirty blonde hair and a husky beard, which appeared to be a little darker than his hair. He said the guy was a typical beatnik. He said the roommate appeared to be in his middle 20s. Would that description fit the man that you saw that night? Just about, yes, sir. I am going to read a description given by Harry Russo of a man that he saw in the apartment of David Ferry. He described this man as having a bushy beard, as being cruddy, very, very dirty. In your opinion, could that description have fit the Lee Harvey Oswald that you knew? I don't see how that could fit him because I've never seen him like that. Perry Russo has described David, David Ferry's roommate, whom he identified as a man he knew as Leon Oswald as very, very dirty, a typical beatneck with a husky beard. Do you recall whether Lee Oswald was clean shaven or had a beard? When I, when I came to New Orleans in about September 20th, he was clean shaven then, and uh, I never saw Lee with a beard. I don't believe he had one, to my knowledge. I think Marina would have mentioned it. And he was also uh, neat when he dressed and uh, uh, clean, it seemed to me. I just feel that uh, Mr. Rosso must have seen someone else that he thinks was Lee Oswald. You were, in 1963, from the period of at least September through November, closely associated with David Ferry? That's, That's right. correct. You knew practically everyone who was associated with him at that time, is that correct? That's correct. 
If someone lived in his house for more than two or three days during that period of time, in other words, might have been there long enough to be considered a roommate, would you have known about it? Yes, certainly. There has been testimony recently about a roommate of Ferry's who was unkempt or wore a beard. Do any of the people you know and who knew Ferry fit this description? James Llewellyn could possibly fit that description very well. Uh, I remember at that time Llewellyn did have some sort of beard and uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call him unkempt, but uh, to some people this might uh, represent being unkempt. But uh, one of the things I've noticed, uh, <coughs> remembering Llewellyn, he bears a uh, striking resemblance to uh, uh, this uh, mock picture of Oswald. Could he have been considered a roommate of Ferry's? Mm, yes, he could have, uh, possibly. Uh, I think uh, he and Ferry did room together sometime, maybe prior to that, maybe around that time. Did you know anyone at the time associated with Ferry by the name of Leon. Well, uh, uh, Jim Llewellyn's last name, uh, sometimes uh, people would address him as, hey, Lou, uh, Lee, or something like that. The facts are these. Russo said Oswald, dirty and with a beard, was at the party that he was Ferry's roommate. He said the party took place in mid-September. He said Lefty Peterson was there. The two possible dates Peterson gives for the party, November 20th and October 4th, make it impossible for the man to have been Oswald. Russo speaks of the roommate's beard. People who knew Oswald say he never had a beard. Peterson says the roommate was at least two inches taller than he, but we know Oswald was Peterson's height. And we know that Russo denied knowing Oswald only three weeks before he testified. What about the other things Russo said? From Jim Garrison's case to, or for Jim Garrison's case to hold up rather, Clay Shaw, using the name of Clay Bertrand, must be proved to have been at the party at David Ferry's apartment as Perry Russo testified. Now, Clay Shaw is not an easy man to forget. If Clay Shaw had been present in a room with Perry Russo, Lee Oswald, and David Ferry, it seems likely he would have been noticed. Did you notice a big man of any description, an older man there? No, sir. There is no one... Uh, over 40 or, uh, in, say, in his 40s or 50s, anything mm. like that. Just Ferry. Did you ever hear the name Clay, first name Clay? No, sir, no. Did you ever hear anybody uh, named, did you ever hear the name Bertrand drop? Do you know? No, sir, no. Have you seen Clay Shaw's picture? Oh, yes, sir. Now, is the man you saw in that picture, uh, was he at that party that night? Well, Clay Shaw? I didn't see it. Have you ever been, were you at that time, or have you ever been in David Ferry's apartment? Never. You've heard of the name Clay Bertrand? I have. Do you know any such person? I do not. Uh, can you state whether or not you are Clay Bertrand? I am not Clay Bertrand. Uh, in 1963, did you ever have occasion to meet or know Lee Harvey Aswell? Never. Did you ever have occasion to meet or know David W. Ferry? I did not. Do you have any knowledge of a plot to assassinate President Kennedy? None whatsoever. Garrison has based his case on a certainty that he can prove Clay Shaw is Clay or Clem Bertrand. The name Clem Bertrand was first introduced by a lawyer named Dean Andrews, who told the Warren Commission a person by that name telephoned him suggesting he provide legal defense for Lee Oswald. Three years later, Garrison suggested to Andrews that Andrews identify Shaw as Bertrand. Andrews said he told Garrison he wouldn't say if Shaw was or was not Clay Bertrand. And the same as Clay Shaw. You say I identified him. I don't know if I did or I did not. Since then, Garrison has taken his former friend, Dean Andrews, before the grand jury where he's been indicted for perjury. Before that happened, Andrews talked with us. Man, I wouldn't know Clay Shaw if I fell across him on the street dead. Right. Has the occasion arisen for you to take, to listen to, uh, to Clay oh, Shaw's yes. voice? Oh, yes, all this popped up. They had him on TV, so I just shut my eyes and listened to the voice, and that's not the voice. 
In other words, you're saying that Clay Bertrand is not Clay Shaw? I'm saying that the voice of Clay Shaw is not the voice that I identify as Clay Bertrand. Right. Now, you have seen Clay Bertrand on two occasions. Uh, two times. You have seen Clay Shaw's picture on the news. Since this happened many times. Okay. Can you say positively that the person you knew as Clay Bertrand is not the person you have seen as Clay Shaw? Scout's honor. He is not. Clay, or Clem Bertrand, does exist. An NBC News reporter has seen him. Clem Bertrand is not his real name. It's a pseudonym used by a homosexual in New Orleans. For his own protection, we will not disclose the real name of the man Andrews knew as Clem Bertrand. His real name has been given to the Department of Justice. He is not Clay Shaw. What then of Perry Russo's testimony? In my conversations with Perry Russo, he has stated that his testimony against Clay Shaw may be a combination of truth, fantasy, and lies. He said he wishes he had never gotten into this, but now he feels he has no choice but to go through with it. He said that he's afraid if he changed his testimony that Garrison might indict him for perjury. He said, suppose Clay Shaw is convicted and gets 20 years and goes through his appeals and he's sitting down there in prison. I might just call from wherever I am and say, bring your film crews down. I've got something to say. On one occasion, Russo said, the hell with truth, the hell with justice. He said, you're asking me to sacrifice myself for Clay Shaw and I won't do it. The JFK conspiracy of the case of Jim Garrison will continue after station identification. Arba Even visits the Today Show tomorrow morning on... In New Ultra Bright toothpaste, a taste you can really feel. New Ultra Bright gives your mouth Appeal. New Ultra Bright Toothpaste, the craziest taste, the freshest breath, the brightest teeth. Put them all together, they spell Sex Appeal. New Ultra Bright gives your mouth <laughs> Sex Appeal. After Ultra Bright, everything else is just toothpaste. Just dump the alcohol out of Halo. Yes, now alcohol's out. So can glycerin's in. In new Halo shampoo. New Halo now gives a soft shampoo. Let's your hair go silky. Yes, now alcohol's out. So can glycerin's in. In new Halo shampoo. Only recently has Jim Garrison revealed the extent of the plot that he says brought about the murder of John F. Kennedy. There was a plan uh, in operation in the city of New Orleans which had entirely different objectives than the killing of the president. That was the last thing in the minds of the people that caused this plan to begin. Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald was a part, assigned a role essentially as decoy. Uh, I, I think I can tell you now uh, that uh, I know, but I mean, I feel like saying for the first time that uh, we've known for many months that fair play for Cuba uh, which he pretended to be so interested in, was a cover for the operation. Oswald was not a communist. Oswald was not pro-Castro. And uh, as a result of the uh, operation, which was working here in the summer of 1963, a spin-off occurred. An unexpected uh, change of direction occurred, which in the fall of 1963 resulted in that lethal apparatus being turned against President Kennedy. And that's uh, what happened, and that's the, the first time I've ever said it publicly. Can Jim Garrison prove his increasingly complicated and far-flung case? Until that case is brought to court before a jury, until the evidence is presented, no one can say. We're concerned here only with examining how Garrison has tried to put together that evidence. On May 12th, Garrison announced he had discovered a code, the same numbers and notebooks of Oswald and Shaw, which, decoded, was... Jack Ruby's private telephone numbers. Now, this is the number in Oswald's notebook, 
and this is the number in Clay Shaw's notebook. A WDSU reporter asked Garrison to explain the code. Mr. Garrison, in Lee Harvey Oswald's diary, the Warren report says the number in there is DD19106. However, you say it's PO. How do you determine uh, that it's PO, sir? Well, it's just uh, more or less by looking at it. But Russian language experts looking at the page in Oswald's notebook said that what Garrison called an O was in fact a Russian D. And the Odom in Shaw's notebook. Garrison's office indicated was a CIA cover. But then a man named Odom called Garrison from Irving, Texas. He said that he had business dealings with Clay Shaw. He said that this was his post office box. He had rented it in 1966. He said that he had no connection with the CIA. Well, do you still think that uh, the number in Lee Harvey Oswald's notebook was, uh, was uh, Jack Ruby's phone number? If I thought it possible to communicate with you, I'd answer it, but I don't think there's any way. Well, Mr. Garrison, if the P.O. box didn't exist until late 65, how could it then be Jack Ruby's phone number? Well, that's a problem for you to think over because you obviously missed the point. Irwin Mann is a cryptographer, a professor of mathematics at New York University. You've examined the numbers found in the notebooks of Lee Oswald and Clay Shaw by Jim Garrison's office, have you not? Yes, I have. And you've seen the explanation given by Mr. Garrison that they are a code for Jack Ruby's private telephone number. Yes, I have. Based on your experience with codes and cryptography, how would you assess Mr. Garrison's explanation? I would say that it's just a guess, but, um, but I, I really believe that uh, this is not an encipherment of that telephone number. Have you ever seen an encipherment like this before? No, I, I certainly have not. In particular, the reaching of the prefix WH from a, a prefix PO is not even unique. What do you mean by not even unique? I mean that, that the fact that the sum of the corresponding digits to the letters in the prefix uh, being 13 uh, does not uh, give uh, a does not give only one prefix uh, back when you go to decipher what you have previously enciphered. It could give any number then. It, it could, could give, out. in this case, I believe, six I see. such prefixes. I see. So it could be any one of six prefixes, and he is arbitrarily selected one which fitted into that uh, uh, essentially path. that is what he has done in other words if you have the answer to begin with you can find a code which works uh, exactly the people involved in this case are not as Jim Garrison likes to point out bank presidents or presidents of the Chamber of Commerce currently serving a term in the New Orleans Parish prison is John Kanzler who was a burglar the story he tells involves two of Jim Garrison's key staff members, Louis Ivan and Lynn Loisel. Mr. Ivan called me up and told me to meet Mr. Wecker, I mean Mr. Loisel again. He said, won't you take a ride with me? Mr. Lazell, we, he was in a, a light gray, a light cream falcon with an arrow on the back. You know, it wasn't like the, the regular detective cars. It was one of those compact cars. So, uh, he said, do you think you can get in and out of the house without anybody knowing? I said, well, you know I can't. I said, why? He said, uh, we might want you to do a job for us. So we proceeded downtown. 
the Dolphin Street. The White House, Red Door. That's me, I think that I can get in there. I said, well, when I was burglarizing, I said, uh, I didn't buy nothing. I said, uh, I could get in. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, uh, I might want you to plant something in there, put something in there. I said, uh, well, listen, man, I said, uh, I said, you sure you're not setting me up to be getting in one of those windows and get my head blown off? So he said, no. I said, well, I don't want to go into nothing with my eyes, you know, closed. I said, what's this all about? He said, I can't tell you. I said, well, man, I said, well, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be a part of it. I said, I think I have a right to know. So he said, oh, well, this has something to do with uh, President Kennedy's assassination. I said, well, why would you want me to put something in there? I said, man, I said, I'm not going to do that. I said, I don't want anything to do with this. I said, I don't want any part of it. Did he tell you whose house it was? No, 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 he didn't tell me whose house it was. Did you later find out? Sure I did. Whose house was it? Uh, Clay Shaw's. Lawyer. Andrews knew Clay Burton. Lee Oswald was his client. Garrison was sure he could fill in the gaps in the case. Now, did you, did Mr. Garrison at one point ask you about certain operations across Lake Pontchartrain? Across the lake. Yes, I think we'd discuss that. Did he ask you if you knew any of the people involved? I think he did. What'd you tell him? Uh, Manny Garcia Gonzalez and Ricardo Davis. Did you know Mr. Gonzalez? No. Did you know Mr. Davis? No. Where did you get those names? Out the air. In other words, these names were fictional as far as you were concerned? Well, I'm trying to see if his cat's kosher, you know. So what? So he's kosher, I don't know. Uh, so you just picked two names out of the air? Right. Now, why did you do that? Well, I don't know what he's up to. He's picking me like chicken, shucking me like corn, stewing me like an oyster. I mean, he ain't put nothing down but air. So I'll give him two names, see which way he's going. In other words, you made up two names to see what he was going to do with them. Right. What did he do with them? Well, I don't know. He hasn't done anything yet. Well, have you had any occasion to have him talk to you about either of those names since then? Uh, about two weeks ago, on a Saturday, are we talking, and he picks up uh, a weapon with an item number on it. What kind of a weapon? A pistol. Semi-automatic. Black. Probably 7.6 millimeter. I didn't examine it. And says that Manny Garcia Gonzalez in Miami or someplace down there got busted for carrying a concealed weapon. And I told him Manny Garcia... Gonzalez was never busted in his life. I didn't believe it. He put the weapon back down. We talked some more. And that was it. I left. Did he tell you this was a gun taken from this man? When from he was... Emmanuel Garcia Gonzalez. When now, he was... I don't know if the Manuel Garcia Gonzalez he's talking about is for real. Or if the Manny Garcia Gonzalez is the name that I pulled out of the air. This I cannot say. Time what was your tell. What was your conclusion from that conversation? Well, if it's the Manuel Garcia Gonzalez that I told him, he's got the right ta-ta, but the wrong ho-ho. We know that Manuel Garcia Gonzalez has not been questioned, but many others have. And many have told us that they've been subjected to pressure to give testimony that would build the case against Clay Shaw. Most would not risk saying so publicly. You're going to hear from some who would. None of them has been paid or received any compensation for us for what he's doing. Did anyone from Mr. Garrison's office contact you uh, before this uh, warrant was sworn out yesterday? Yes. What did they ask you? They wanted me to go down to New Orleans to look at some pictures. Did they uh, try and persuade you in any way? Did they offer you anything? Uh, yes. What did they Clothing. Want? Clothing? Yes. And that they offered me best rooms down there and just everything. 
Are you afraid to go back to New Orleans? In a sense. Why are because you? Because it's my record down there. Be afraid of anything else now. Uh, you mean you're afraid that they will bring out something from your past? Try to. A few months back, they uh, called me out to the control center in Angola. And uh, there was two district attorney investigators who came to me with some uh, pictures in a briefcase. Who were they? Uh, one of them was Lynn Loisel, and I forgot the other one's name. They, Perhaps uh, Louis Ivan? Yes, sir, I believe that's the name. Well, uh, Mr. Loisel, uh, the way he opened up the conversation, uh, he asked me what was the thing that I wanted the most. I told him, needless to say, my freedom. So he said I could either be cut loose right away or I could be made to uh, serve this whole 90 year sentence. The way he said it, the district attorney, Mr. Garrison, could cut me loose completely. He would say he was a very powerful man and uh, that he could hurt many people or he could also help them. All depending on how they cooperated with him. Now what happened to you after you came back here to the parish prison? Well, he started asking me, uh, uh, you see, I live at the 1300 block of Charters way back when I first come to the States. And then uh, I live in the 900 block of Esplanade, which puts me in a good position around Mr. Clay's house. And uh, he wanted me to say that uh, I have been approached by Mr. Shaw on a couple of occasions, you see, and I refused to say that. I told him, no, I can't say that. Approached in what way? Uh, homosexual approach. And he wanted me to say that uh, Mr. Clayshaw was claimed by a train. Had you ever been approached by anyone meeting that description at all? No, sir. Uh, I have never been approached by anyone like that. When he was told what Tories and John Kanzler had said, Jim Garrison answered, I wouldn't dignify those people with an answer. Alvin Bobuff was brought to Washington by us to submit to a lie detector test. We paid for the test, for his expenses, and for his lawyers. We paid nothing more. Did you actually believe Lynn Loisel attempted to bribe you to give him false information concerning President Kennedy's assassination? Yes. Al, I have before me here what is purported to be the transcript of the conversation that was recorded there uh, between your attorney, yourself, and Lynn Loisel. Now, are you prepared to say that basically it's a correct transcription of the record of the conversation that took place nothing's been cut it's accurate to every detail i'm going to read a couple of phrases from it and i'd like to ask you some questions about it this is lynn lazell speaking and i said the boss is in a position he's speaking to your attorney the boss is in a position to put him in a job you know possibly of his choosing of al's choosing also that they would be we would make a hero out of him instead of a villain, you understand. Everything would be to your satisfaction. We can change the story around, you know, enough to positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, eliminate him into any type of conspiracy or what have you. Later on, he says, and I quote again, I would venture to say, well, I'm, you know, fairly certain we could put $3,000, he snaps his fingers, just like that, you know. I'm sure we'd help him financially. I'm sure we real quick, we could get him a job. Now, is that basically the substance of, of the offer that was made in front of your attorney at that point? That's by correct. Mr. Do you believe he was acting with Garrison's? Uh, yes, my attorney asked him, did, uh, was Jim Garrison aware of his presence and what he was going to say? And he said yes. After the district attorney's office, the New Orleans district attorney's office, found out about this tape recording that had been made, what happened? They have got some pictures uh, of me uh, that they said they'd hold over my head if I uh, came out with this. They threatened to give these pictures out like they were going out of style if I come out in the open and said they need ch uh, charges of bribery. The deputy New Orleans police superintendent cleared Loisel and Ivan of Bo Buff's charges. He said money had been offered to Bo Buff, but that the offer did not violate the police code of conduct because historically police have paid informers. He said that he could find no evidence that Bo Buff had been threatened. Now this is Fred Lehman's. 
He ran a Turkish bath on Canal Street in New Orleans. You recently had contact with the district attorney's office in New Orleans? Yes. Could you tell me about that? Well, I received a call at my place. I'm now in business in Slidell by a man that identified himself as a Mr. Robert E. Lee with the district attorney's office in New Orleans. He said he would like to talk to me, but not on the phone, and wanted to know when it would be convenient for me to come in to the office. He said, did I know Clay Shaw? And I said, well, I knew him. Uh, he said, did he used to come up to your place? And I said, well, uh, some of the times, yes. And he said, did he use the name of Clay Bertram? And I told him, well, I couldn't be sure that he'd ever used that name because I didn't remember names too good or dates. And he said, well, it would be very helpful to them if I could remember any of that. And I said, well, I don't want to get involved in anything like this. I said, I'm trying to get a lease on a building in New Orleans now, if I can raise the money for it, that I think would make a fine uh, nightclub and a private club. And he said, well, I'm sure that if you help us, that we can help you and you will get the place that you want. So then he asked me questions about, uh, couldn't I remember that Clay Shaw had used the name Clay Bertrand when he came to the baths? And uh, the way he asked it, I figured he wanted a yes, so I told him yes and uh, asked me, uh, was there any uh, other people that uh, Clay Shaw, or they kept saying Clay Bertrand, had come up with? And I said, there's one young fellow. And he said, well, would his name have been Lee? And uh, Mr. Lee said, that would be very helpful, too. So I said, yes, there's one man that uh, he called Lee. So uh, he said, well, wait here. He said, uh, Mr. Garrison should be in on the rest of this. So he brought Mr. Garrison in and introduced him to me. And uh, he asked, wouldn't this young fellow, he says, couldn't you remember that he had a goatee or a little beer beatnik type? A beard. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, yes, I can remember that. And uh, then I told Mr. Garrison right out uh, what my plans were in trying to raise money for this club, what would be a private club here in New Orleans. And he said well, he was sure that uh, I would get it and that in any way at all that he could help me, he would. The people that helped him, he took care of them. Was there any amount of money mentioned? Yes, I told him that I needed $2,500. What did he say about that? Uh, he said he was sure that I wouldn't have any trouble getting that money. What happened after that? Then Mr. Garrison said, well, we want to get all this down in a statement. Uh, he said, I'll send the stenographer in. Mr. Lee and I sat down to make the statement. Well, I couldn't remember everything as we started the statement, so Mr. Lee would ask me questions. His questions would be, uh, for instance, if I didn't uh, remember too good, he, he would say, well, wouldn't he have been doing this or that? The uh, statement was then typed up, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you signed it? I signed it, but I did not have it uh, sworn to. Mm -hmm. Who was there when you signed it? Uh, I believe Mr. Ward was, Mr. Lee, and the stenographer. What happened then? The last time was I was down there, Mr. Lee told me, he said, well, uh, Fred, he said, I'm sure Mr. Garrison's going to do something for you because he always helps people that help him, but he said anything that has to do with money matters, him giving you any money, cannot be done in front of anybody else because that wouldn't look good. He said, so you're going to have to just talk to him person to person because that way why there are no witnesses to it, whatever deal you two make. So I went on back to Slidell and I did not call Mr. Ivan. And I got to thinking about this pretty bad and uh, it just struck me that uh, what they were wanting me to do, and the more I thought about it, I figured, well, it wouldn't be right to swear somebody's life away or ruin the rest of their life on false testimony, no matter what was offered. Now, when you say it wasn't true, let's go back. Did you ever know Clay Shaw as Clay Bertrand? No. When you told them that a young man named Lee came up there with Clay Shaw, that was not true? No, it wasn't. And they knew it wasn't true? 
Well, I would figure that, too, because uh, Mr. Lee previously had asked me, didn't I remember these different things, and it would be helpful if I remembered them. But in spite of that, you did put all these things in the statement because you thought that's what they wanted in the statement, and you thought you might be able to help yourself by doing it. Yes. Uh -huh. Would you say that all of the pertinent answers you gave them were answers that they suggested to you with leading questions? Yes, definitely. Because otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what information they wanted. And they told you this statement that you signed is now in Mr. Garrison's private safe? Yes. Are you giving this statement to us freely and voluntarily? Freely and voluntarily. In fact, uh, I have hinted to you and uh, that I could use some help, but you've told me frankly there's no way, shape, or form that you can give me any monetary assistance. Uh, are you willing that we show this on television? Yeah. If it'll help to correct maybe the wrong that I've done, Mr. Shaw, in giving that statement and signing it to Mr. Garrison, why? Go ahead. Yesterday, Fred Lehman's mailed a letter to Jim Garrison. In it, Lehman said that the statement he had signed concerning Clay Shaw was not true. Now, we cannot say that the murder of John F. Kennedy did not happen the way Jim Garrison says it did. We cannot say he does not have the evidence to prove it. We can say this. The case he has built against Clay Shaw is based on testimony that did not pass a lie detector test that Garrison ordered, and Garrison knew it. One prospective witness admitted in advance he was going to lie. Members of Garrison's staff, in trying to strengthen the case against Shaw, have threatened and offered inducements to potential witnesses. The results of his four months of public investigation have been to damage reputations, to spread fear and suspicion, and worst of all, to exploit the nation's sorrow and doubts about President Kennedy's death. Jim Garrison has said, let justice be done. Though the heavens fall, we seek the truth. So do we. Good night. The film testimony you've seen was edited. The unedited film is available to any authorized investigator with a legitimate reason to see it. This program was produced by NBC News, which is solely responsible for its content. Foreign Minister Abba Ibn of Israel visits the Today Show tomorrow morning. Then stay tuned with NBC News for thorough coverage of the U.N. General Assembly, scheduled to reconvene at 10.30 Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow.